Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm your host John Lorden and today we're going to be looking into a case of my new home state. I've actually been holding off on this one. I wanted to feature it uh, once I got out here. This is a case that takes place in Minnesota, a few hours away from where I am uh, now living. And this is the case of Brandon Victor Swanson. And we're going to start with the profile on charlieproject.org. And we can see a bunch of photos of Brandon here, including this last one, which is an age progression to age 24, circa 2013, as you can see down here. So um, if Brandon is indeed still alive and you see him, he'd probably look most similar to this, maybe a little bit older. He's been missing since May 14th, 2008 from Marshall, Minnesota, uh, endangered missing. He was born January 30th, 1989. He was 19 years old at the time he went missing. Five foot six, 120 pounds, Caucasian male, brown hair, blue eyes. Swanson wears black wire-framed eyeglasses. He has pierced ears and a small scar above his left eye. He is legally blind in his left eye. He was wearing a white t-shirt with a blue striped polo sweatshirt, baggy blue jeans, a black hooded zip-up jacket with an emblem on the back, a white flat-billed Minnesota Twins baseball cap twisted to the side, white sneakers, a heavy sterling silver necklace, and one stud earring in each ear. So let's get into the details of the disappearance. Swanson was last seen in Marshall, Minnesota on May 14th, 2008. It was the last day of classes at Minnesota West Community and Technical College in Canby, Minnesota, where he was enrolled in a wind turbine program and he had gone out with a friend to celebrate. Swanson was on his way home to Marshall when he accidentally drove his car into a ditch where it got stuck. Um, I just wanna stop here and say, I've read several different accounts about this and I don't know that the phrasing drove his car into a ditch is the most accurate. Um, it appears that he was off of the main highway. He was on a gravel road. It was muddy um, and it, he, was, he was off of the road, but I don't, I don't see anything saying there was an actual ditch. When his parents got to his vehicle, there was no damage. So using that term, that term's used kind of loosely in the retelling of the story, and I just wanted to clarify it. Um, he slid off road, his car was stopped in mud, um, and there was this, uh, this road was very steep, and basically the angle that his car was at, it was like his tires couldn't get good traction. But as far as I can tell, not really a ditch, not an accident that you would normally think of when you hear that term, so I just wanted to clear that up a little bit. He wasn't injured in the accident. He called his parents on his cellular phone at 12.30 a.m. and asked for help. His parents were unable to find him, so Swanson said he was going to walk to the nearby town of Lind, Minnesota, where he could see lights. He was on the phone with his father while he was talking. Shortly after 2 a.m., Swanson suddenly swore, and the call ended abruptly. His father tried to call him back several times, but never got an answer. Swanson has never been heard from again. His father spent several hours looking for him and then notified the police at 6.30 a.m. The following day, authorities using cellular phone records located Swanson's car one and a half miles north of the Lyon-Lincoln County line off Highway 68 west of Taunton, Minnesota. There was no sign of him at the scene. An extensive search of the area turned up no sign of him. The car wasn't anywhere near the place Swanson said it was. He had been 20 miles away from there. Apparently had gotten confused about his location. Although there were some accounts that he'd been drinking alcohol that evening, investigators don't believe he was intoxicated or otherwise impaired when he disappeared. Some authorities believe he blundered into the Yellow Medicine River while he was walking in the dark. The river, which is up to 15 feet deep in places, was running high and fast at that time. Searches of the river didn't produce his body, however, and there's no evidence to support any theory. Wow, that's kind of a statement, but um, somewhat accurate. There is literally no evidence. They can't find a trace of him, and if that sounds familiar, young man, college age, body of water, disappearance, um, this definitely has remnants of the smiley face murder theory. Um, in case you don't know, we did an episode where uh, we did a two-parter actually on that a while ago, and I believe this case was actually included in their theory on that. Um, but the theory there is that young um, college-aged males are being killed 
uh, usually left in a body of water. And then when they find the body or the entry point for where the body went into the water, there's usually a smiley face spray painted on it somewhere around it. Um, I personally don't hold a lot of stock in that theory. If you watch the episode, you'll see that uh, the conclusion I come to by the end of it is that smiley face graffiti is extremely common. Uh, where I used to live in California, there was actually a giant smiley face burned into the side of a, of a hill. Um, and I think that the theory was being pulled together by some former police investigators that um, I don't know if they were trying to write a book or I, I really don't know what the motivation is, but the theory just did not seem very sound to me. I don't think, even if that theory is true, I don't think this case falls into it. Um, we don't have a body. This is a missing persons case. So, um, and definitely there's no smiley face tag to associate to it. Swanson is a 2007 graduate of Marshall High School. He had made arrangements to transfer to Iowa Western Community College in Council Bluffs in August of 2008. He planned to eventually enroll in a four-year university and have a career in the sciences. He had worked at the hy V food store for four years before his disappearance. Swanson's mother describes him as an avid reader with many interests and very devoted to his family. His case remains unsolved. Brandon's law, named for Swanson, was passed later in 2008. The law requires Minnesota police to begin an immediate search for missing adults under 21, as well as older adults who are missing under suspicious circumstances. So this is definitely one of those cases where a tragedy um, is turned into something of benefit for the rest of us, really. Um, I think that that's very important, Brandon's law. From what I've read, apparently his parents heard a statement from an officer at one point that he's an adult, he has the right to uh, disappear. You know, he can go traveling and not tell you guys where he is. And they may have delayed how quickly they started acting on the search. Based on the info I'm seeing, they jumped on the search pretty quick, but I have heard in many, many cases that it is sometimes difficult to get police to start searches for people. Um, I've heard that reasoning before, hey, people have the right to disappear. And my suggestion, I actually had someone contact me this past week um, that was a friend of someone that had gone missing. And they were just ask, asking for any type of, of advice I could give them to help. And one of the, I think the first point I actually wrote was, be sure that the uh, police you're dealing with have filed an actual missing persons report. I've heard so many cases where people go to police and they talk to them and the officers make up these rules. Oh, you can't do that yet. They have to be missing for a certain period of time. I've heard that information fluctuate so wildly, but in some cases I've heard that if you are extremely persistent, you can get them to file that, that report. And filing that report all of a sudden puts them a bit on the hook because now it has been properly documented. Now they are aware that this is a missing persons investigation and that kind of raises their responsibility a little bit, which um, is something you wanna do very early in these cases because I've also been in contact with people that are um, living with long-term uh, mi missing people issues and there is always a period of contention that comes later when you're dealing with the authorities and you feel like you don't have your answer yet. It is a very natural progression of what you're going through in these type of cases. So it's very, very important that extremely early on, you take all the right steps, try to get that attention, get everything documented, get everything formalized so that that pressure that you're gonna deal with later about, hey, are you guys doing your job or not, is actually backed up. Um, all right, so here's Canby where he was going to school and here's Marshall uh, where he was living. And you can see there's a Highway 68 that goes direct all the way through there. Now from the information I'm reading, he was actually off of this highway. He was on some type of other frontage road. Um, some cases I'm reading say he was northwest of the highway, which would put him kind of up in here for some reason. I don't know how you can go north and west of the highway. You're either going north of it or west of it uh, from what I'm seeing here. But um, I've also heard different reports saying that he was found closer to Taunton. Other ones are saying his car was found in Porter. So I'm really not positive um, which is the right answer. But somewhere in this stretch is where his car was found. And Lind, the town that he thought he could walk to, way down here. And I'm really not sure um, why he thought he could walk there. 
I'm not sure how that's any closer than him walking to Marshall if he was indeed somewhere close to Highway 68, um, unless he thought he was taking some kind of back road or something. I'm, I'm really, the logic behind this is, is kind of confusing to me, but this is the layout. So here's his school, here's where he was supposed to be going, here's where he thought he was going, and his car was found somewhere right about here. Now here's a little more information. This is from CNN.com, and this is um, some more about how the phone call went between him and his parents. He was absolutely positive he knew where he was, Brian Swanson said. The parents stayed on the phone, talking to their son as they headed to pick him up. But when they arrived, there was no car and no Brandon. They turned around and flashed the lights on their truck. We were saying, we're flashing our lights, Annette Swanson said. Over the phone, they could hear their son working the light switch in his car. Click, 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 click. Don't you see me? He asked. There was nothing, the father said. Absolutely nothing. Everyone grew frustrated. At one point, he hung up on me. So I called him back and apologized, his mother said. Swanson told his parents he would walk back to his friend's house in Lind. His father drove home to drop Annette off and then headed back to look for the teen. They exchanged calls just before 2 a.m. and eventually carried on a long conversation while the younger Swanson was walking, trying to direct his father to where he was. He told his father to look for him at a nightclub parking lot that was a popular meeting spot in Lind, but at the 47-minute mark, the call ended abruptly. The teen shouted an expletive, and the phone went dead. I just can't imagine how frustrating and terrifying this must be for the parents. I mean you know, to hear him swear and then all of a sudden the phone goes dead. Um, I'm sure their imaginations were racing. They're driving around looking for him. They're already tired and frustrated from looking for him for a long period of time. And then you have something like that happen. Um, it seems pretty terrifying to me. Uh, so Reddit also has a thread on this and Kafka Lover here has some interesting points I wanted to share with you. I remember reading about this case a while ago. I know that his father maintained that Brandon was not intoxicated, and I am sure that he knows his son better than anyone else, but respectfully, number one, Brandon's friends reported that he was drinking that night, and number two, Brandon's car was found on a gravel access road, not the main highway, which suggests to me that Brandon was trying to avoid the main roads because he was under the influence. Now, police have also stated that based on their estimations of seeing the scene, they don't think he was intoxicated as well. I'm not quite sure how they come to that conclusion, but based on, I guess, where the car was and how it was found, um, they don't believe that he was actually intoxicated. They do uh, recognize that he was drinking earlier in the night, but from what they can see, it doesn't appear that he was impaired. It's also strange that Brandon thought that he was close to a town near his house, but was in reality 20 to 25 miles away. He was obviously disoriented and was likely not thinking clearly, leaving his car to cut across country in the middle of the night. I think the searchers now have decided that if he had fallen into the river, his remains would have been found based upon the exhaustive SAR efforts already undertaken. I believe the idea now is that he may have succumbed to hypothermia in some kind of abandoned structure or under old farm equipment or in a field that has subsequently been cut for hay. Still, it's alarming how after five years, Brandon seems to have disappeared into thin air. Web Sleuths also has a pretty healthy post on this. Uh, I think it's like 11 pages. And I did bump into some information there that a pipe was found, but I couldn't find the source for that information. So I don't know um, how much to really believe that. I'm assuming that they mean that a pipe in terms of marijuana use was found, but even that I'm not sure of, but uh, I thought I would mention that. I do think it's important to call back to that little detail in the Charlie Project profile about him being blind in one eye though, and just thinking about you know how dark it can get out here and him walking around in the thick of things, uh, legally blind in his left eye. I think there is a pretty good chance that he may have uh, fallen into some type of water, gotten wet, um, you know, was he swept away by a river? I'm not sure of the viability of that, but at least if he uh, had gotten wet for some reason, he probably had to fight uh, hypothermia with some of the, the cold temperatures that were going on at that time of year. So I think those theories are very plausible. 
Now, a question I had was about the cell phone because I, I couldn't find any detail about when the parents called it back, if it actually rang or not. Um, you know, it's very different if you call a cell phone and it goes straight to voicemail because at that point you know it's either out of service or it's been turned off for some reason. But if they called it back and it continued to ring, that would be a whole different thing and would also leave some pings that the police officers might be able to trace. Um, found a little information here at Web Sleuths. This is from CJ. One more thing I just noticed in an article. Dahl uh, said law enforcement expected Brandon Swanson's cell phone to not work, but when they made calls to it during the day on Wednesday and Thursday, the phone rang and eventually calls were directed to his voicemail. Later Thursday, calls were immediately directed to Brandon Swanson's voicemail, which likely meant the phone's battery needed to be charged, Dahl said. I had originally thought his phone must have cut off because he fell into water or something. If there are cell towers nearby, I don't think it cut off due to lack of service. Strange. And he does make a good point. Um, if a cell phone is dropped into water, if it's not a waterproof cell phone, and many of them are not, I would imagine that it would be damaged very quickly and the calls should go directly to voicemail. But that should not dry out in the course of a day and then all of a sudden the next day you're able to call it and it's ringing. Um, so I'm really kind of unsure what happened in this case. There is a website called the search for brandon.blogspot.com and um, it's a little bit out of date. However, if you want to see the exhaustive and extensive searches that they've done, this is a very good catalog of it. Um, they also keep track of some of the media that's gone on. You can see CNN, um, Nancy Grace featured uh, some information about Brandon, but it really talks about what types of searches they've done, how many people have showed up, um, and one of the cool things I noticed on Web Sleuths was Web Sleuths was even uh, one of the moderators was contacted by someone that was organizing a search and they gave out a bunch of information so that volunteers could come out and help search for Brandon, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, but if you want to see just the extensive effort that they've gone to with searches, um, you should really check out the search for brandon.blogspot.com. Now, believe it or not, despite how it seems like this case is, um, you know, getting several years old, there have even been recent searches conducted. This is from TwinCities.com, and this was posted on October 13th, 2015. Searchers have been looking for Brandon Swanson since he disappeared May 14th, 2008, while driving home to Marshall, Minnesota. On Saturday, they'll be back out again. This weekend, teams will focus on farm fields northwest of Porter, Minnesota, an area they haven't been able to search for several years because of harvest schedules and bad weather, said Ken Anderson, who is spearheading the effort. As long as we have resources and areas to search, we hope to come across Brandon, said Anderson, president of Emergency Support Services, a Minneapolis-based organization dedicated to helping search and rescue and recovery operations. As long as we still have approval of the family, law enforcement, and landowners, our intention is to continue to do this. It's pretty hard to do searches for seven years, but there are families that are waiting after seven years. There are families still waiting after 20 years. And once again, um, I just wanna call out this organization, Emergency Support Services um, and Ken Anderson for doing amazing work, helping these families, helping to keep hope that they will find some trace of their loved ones out there. Um, it just always inspires me that there are people willing to get into the dark of some of these stories, um, these realities actually, and help people try to find the light in them. And it's organizations like this that um, I think we really need to appreciate and call out. So another article from TwinCities.com um, by Mary Devine, who actually wrote the previous article as well. It's been five years, but Brian and Annette Swanson still keep the porch light burning for their missing son. The Swansons turned on the light May 14, 2008, the night Brandon Swanson disappeared while driving home to Marshall, Minnesota. There's no reason to turn it off now, Brian Swanson said Monday, May 13. I'm pretty sure we're not going to find him alive, but I still want to believe that we will find him. That's probably a stretch, but I still want to believe that. And... I truly hope they do. Of course, one of the theories you can look at here um, kind of calls back to that um, statement that I made about law enforcement frequently saying that uh, people have the right to disappear. 
I think it's extremely slim. I'm not, I, I really don't hold a lot of stock in it, but you do have to consider the possibility that he disappeared of his own accord. Um, like I said, very, very minute. I think the parents are, are right to think that he is um, likely deceased, but that's what missing people is all about. We have really no idea. Um, we don't know. He could be out there somewhere. Obviously, they did an age progression picture of him um, f for the reason that just in case he is alive out there somewhere, you never know what could happen to people. We have seen cases where people are not able to remember their previous life. If he was injured in some way, could have been taken in by somebody, might not know who he is. I know the amnesia scenario sounds like something out of a film, but we have actually seen cases where that has happened. So I don't want to rule out the chance that Brandon is still alive. Um, and also when you consider, I mean, look at how extensive these searches have been. Uh, how could he just literally disappear like that? We're talking clothing, shoes, hat, his cell phone. I mean, I'm sure he had his wallet, his keys, his belt. There should be trace evidence out there somewhere. Now, is it under some bales of hay or in some farmer's yard in some corner that he hasn't uh, searched yet? I really don't know. But considering that they have cell phone pings and those only work within a certain a, a limited area of a few miles, I think about three to five miles, I'm really surprised and knowing that they were able to ring his cell phone for two days, I'm very, very surprised that they haven't at least found that. Where is the cell phone? I think finding that cell phone is a critical step to finding what happened to Brandon Swanson. Um, and I really hope that someday they do. And I will keep an eye on this case. If I do see that they're willing to um, do more searches and they're looking for more volunteers, you, you can bet that uh, I'm going to take that, that couple hour drive and get out there and see if I can help them because um, cases like this, they just really, they really hit me in the heart. This is a kid that had his whole life ahead of him, already had plans for his life, was already knocking down those pegs to really set him, himself up to get to the career he wanted. And a tragedy like this comes along and all of a sudden, all, all those plans are just stopped. And uh, it's, it's really a bit of a heartbreaker. So to all my new neighbors here in Minnesota, please share this information. Please keep an eye on this case. And maybe if you get the chance to volunteer on a search for Brandon or for anyone else, you'll think about doing it. Um, it's very important. These searches don't happen without volunteers. So if nothing else comes out of this video, I hope that all of you brain scratchers out there will consider donating some time on cases like this um, and helping to find these people. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition, the first edition of Brain Scratch Searchlight from the new office. I uh, really appreciate each and every one of you out there. Thank you so much for helping my channel keep growing and the more people we have, the better chance we have at really helping with these cases and these messages getting spread out. Um, and I'm still looking for that day. One of these days, I know we're gonna help find somebody and it's gonna be because of you 